I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. All the spiritual fruit the world will see will be seen in the branches. What kind of spiritual fruit will come from the vine of Jesus? Can grapevines produce pumpkins or corn stalks grow wheat? The logical answer is no. But in today's world of science and DNA modification, I am not so sure. When we embrace the born-again experience offered by Jesus, we allow the Holy Spirit to resurrect new spiritual life in our dead spiritual bodies. The Apostle Peter referred to this action as becoming partakers of the divine nature, while the Apostle Paul wrote that God gave to each born-again believer the measure of faith. The new life imputed into our human spirit is the spark of God's own divine nature. It is His essence, it is His spirit, and His righteousness. This imputed righteousness is much more than God having a favorable opinion. The righteousness of Christ is the divine nature of Jesus. It's the measure of faith we all receive at new birth. Consider this thought. We have resident in us a deposit of God's divine nature. We might associate God's divine nature to spiritual DNA. God's DNA code has total redemptive power and it has a mission and purpose in the covenant of the New Testament. The will of God is coded into His divine DNA, and coded into God's DNA are the fruits of righteousness that will transform our lives. All that we can be in God is coded into His divine DNA. But DNA coding is not a guarantee. It is only a path that could be followed. For example, should a person have a DNA propensity to be an alcoholic, that is no guarantee of a life of alcoholism. This person still must take the first drink. We must act upon our DNA instincts before this coding can influence our lives. Should we desire to know the will of God, then we must allow His divine DNA to mature and influence our lives. This type of maturing can only occur through our endurance of the fruit-bearing cycle. To answer the question, what kind of spiritual fruit will come from the vine of Jesus? The answer is simple, the fruit of discipleship. Our Heavenly Father is glorified by showing ourselves to the world that we are the disciples of Christ.
Should discipleship be the spiritual fruit we produce? Then what is the goal of discipleship? This is a simple but difficult question to answer because true discipleship is lost in the rhetoric of church religion. Nearly all local congregations have a doctrinal series taught by the pastor referred to as discipleship instruction. The context of these classes is the key doctrines taught by their denomination. Once the series is completed, we are considered disciples with certificates to prove our success. Is this tradition the discipleship that brings glory to our Heavenly Father? Discipleship must be much more than simple classroom instruction. What did Jesus teach about discipleship? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Discipleship is a continual, growing process of being conformed to the image of our master. The King James Version uses the English concept of perfection to describe this process. How is this possible? How can we be perfect like Jesus is perfect? There is no way we can stand before Jesus without any human flaw or weakness. We are human flesh. The idea of spiritual perfection is foreign and not attainable. Maybe our frustration with this verse can be found in the English word the translators use to describe our discipleship process. The Greek word used in this verse is katartzal, and this word has the application of a maturing process that is designed to repair, adjust, and restore a person to a healthy spiritual state of mind. The English concept of perfection is not found in this Greek word. Jesus taught that true discipleship must include the process of being repaired, restored, adjusted, and set in right order. In order to be a disciple of Christ, we must continually yield to the fruit-bearing process and allow our lives to be set in right order. The perfecting process is the fruit-bearing cycle. The goal of our fruit-bearing cycle is to reproduce in us the image of Jesus Christ. Let's read. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The image of Christ is not as abstract as we think. Jesus taught in John chapter 5 verse 30 that by himself he could do nothing. God empowered Jesus to accomplish his mission. Simply stated, the image of Christ is self-weakness, God's strength. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Apostle Paul 
understood that the image of Christ is a progressive revelation matured in us from one degree of glory to another. God cannot reveal all of His glory and image in us and through us at one time. We would be destroyed by such an action. Therefore, God made the image of Christ a seasonal experience. The fruit of righteousness is the progressive revelation of Christ's image being reproduced in us. When we come to grips with the idea that we have the DNA of God's divine nature planted in our spirit, then our fruitfulness becomes clear. The more we yield to the influence of God's DNA, the more the image of Christ can grow in our lives. To be a true disciple of Jesus, we must allow His nature to mature in us. When we think of the fruit of the Spirit, our thoughts go to the epistles, to the Galatians and the Ephesians. Let's read. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. We all have read these verses before, but do we understand the fruit-bearing process needed to mature the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We look on these attributes as individual character traits we should seek after. One person may ask God for more peace, while another may pray for more patience. This is the wrong approach to seeking the fruit of the Spirit. In truth, there is only one fruit produced by the vine of Christ, and that fruit is the image of Jesus. All the character traits found in Galatians and Ephesians come from the same vine, and that vine is Jesus Christ. The more we allow the fruit-bearing cycle to reveal the image of Christ the more the fruit of the Spirit will manifest. Don't seek after the fruit of the Spirit as individual character traits, but seek the face of Jesus, and these character traits will develop naturally. How is this possible? The answer to our question is simple. All the fruits of the Spirit are resident with us in God's divine DNA. The more we become partakers of the divine nature, the more the image of Christ is formed in us, and the more we see the fruit of the Spirit manifest. We know that the fruit produced in us is the image of Christ. But what is the goal of our fruit-bearing cycle? Jesus made it clear that the goal of his fruit-bearing cycle is to make us his disciples.
he said, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Let's return to the influence God's divine DNA should have on our lives. His DNA is a blueprint and a plan for the image of Christ being formed in us. God's blueprint is tailored to the uniqueness of each born-again believer. God's plan for me is not the same for you, and His plan for you is not the same for me. We all have narrow paths to walk that go in the same direction, having the same goal, but each path is unique to the individual. God has a plan and purpose for each life, and that plan is eternally etched into our spiritual DNA. This spiritual principle brings us to a reoccurring frustration heard in the body of Christ. What is God's plan for my life? How can I know His direction and purpose? We feel such guilt at not knowing our true spiritual purpose that our hopes wither on the vine. This guilt and frustration is not well founded. It is the responsibility of the vine to mature fruit on the branches, not the branches to discover the will of the vine. All that we seek from God is found in the image of Christ. The more we allow the image of Christ to influence our thoughts and free will, the greater insight we have into God's plan and purpose. The more we yield to Jesus in personal relationship, the more we become true disciples of Christ. God would never put us into situations where He had not prepared us for the mission. Let's read from the second epistle to Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God gave us the Bible in order to teach and train us in righteousness. Our fruit-bearing cycle is the equipping process used by God to prepare us to do every good work. To be used by God requires attitude changes on our behalf. It is not natural for us to desire good works. Our natural inclination is to self-centered gratification. This base human attitude frustrates the image of Christ. How does God equip us to do good works when we are inclined to be so self-absorbed? Jesus, in his admonition to his disciples, made clear the necessary attitude to do His will. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The greatest in the kingdom of God shall be God's servant. From these words we can glean that the image of Christ is also an image of a servant. Jesus did not come like a mighty king, demanding tribute and submission. 
He came as a servant, seeking fellow servants who would build up his kingdom. How did Jesus come as a servant? A study of the Gospels would show that Jesus came more as a teacher and prophet than as a simple servant. We have a paradox. How do we reconcile these two images of Christ? The epistle to the Philippians brings clarity to these questions. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus did not become human flesh to be a servant to mankind. He came as a servant to God. Obedience to God's will proved the servant heart in Jesus. Calvary was the final destination of Jesus, but obedience to God his Father was his mission and purpose. For Jesus, the sacrifice of Calvary was nothing more than the ultimate expression of obedience to God's plan. The cross proved his servant attitude. Jesus did not come to be a servant to mankind. He came to be a servant to God. Up until now, we have defined the image of Christ as self-weakness, God's strength. But let's add a covering element to our pursuit of the image of Christ, and that cover is the servant attitude. Like Jesus, we are not called by God to serve mankind. We are called by God to serve God. Our Christian service must be dedicated to the plan and purpose of God not to our family, or to our church, or even to our country, but to God. We see this servant attitude in Jesus. He did not seek service to his family only, nor the Sanhedrin, or even to Israel. Jesus sought to follow the plan of God, and that plan led to the bloody cross of Calvary. we want to bring glory to Jesus, then we must become his disciples, dedicated to the plan and mission of God. In this way, God our Father is glorified by our spiritual fruit. Now, we are at the crux of the issue. The equipping process used by the Holy Spirit to reproduce the image of Christ will develop a true servant attitude. And in this way, we become the disciples of Jesus. Discipleship. In most Christian denominations, Discipleship has been relegated to a membership class. Often pastors refer to these classes as discipleship instruction. The thought being that once we have completed the instruction, 
we are considered disciples of Christ. We might be disciples of our denomination with full voting rights, but I don't think we are true disciples of Christ. Discipleship in most Christian circles is a cookie cutter program designed to indoctrinate brothers and sisters in Christ in the pet doctrines of our denominations. True discipleship is not a religious program. It is a discovery process that will expose our true potential in Christ. Our mission as pastors and teachers is to help our congregations to discover their divine DNA and to nurture the image of Christ in them. A plan and mission lays ahead for each member of our congregation and our pastoral responsibility is to aid in the discovery of their mission. We must encourage and nurture the servant attitude in our congregations because the servant attitude reveals the image of Christ. God's plan for Jesus included a stop at Calvary. Where does your path lead?